some of you have probably seen it there's been a really cool interview with Kanye on um, GQ where he essentially talks about his plans for Yeezy his plans for architecture and buildings some stuff about new music and just generally a little bit more clarity when it comes to his uh, political affiliations and so far um, judging by what I've read um, because I gave it one quick read before I headed out for my run he sounded pretty clear-minded he sounded um quite centered um he sounded like he finally arrived at a stage where, um, that most creatives want to should be aspiring to uh, uh, arrive to um it's the stage where you suddenly got a few money right where essentially you've amassed so much wealth through your creative endeavors that no one um you're kind of um you know you're kind of the leader of your own ship you don't really need to answer to anybody which essentially is the the zenith that is the resting place that is the heaven that is the yeah, utopia for most creatives right to get to a place where you don't you'd never need to accept notes or recommendations or advice from anybody ever again um because mostly you know there there are there are some occasions where some insight some info um, some pointers can lead you in the right direction but for the most part if you're a creative of the truest sense of the word you probably can do it on your own right in terms of the idea itself maybe fleshing it out and getting it you know ready to ship and having it in people's hands you might need more people but in terms of actually sparking the initial idea you're the one that still should drives it forward you're the one that comes out with something in ingenuity in, in um in due it what's that word called ingenious right you come up with that ingenious idea you're the one that breaks the boundaries you're the one that's pushing the limits and then essentially you're trying to navigate the real world and trying to make it work but the i the advice from random strangers doesn't necessarily add anything to it and um it got me thinking about the fu money thing because i remember it was a clip from a movie isn't it right because i remember hearing about that term first maybe through joe rogan podcast right but um i think it was from a movie clip let's see if i can find it now i think it's called fu money I think it's a clip from a movie. See if I can find it. There we go. It's from. Where's it from? It's from The Gambler. John Goodman says that his character. So let's probably put this up here and I'll just play it. Actually, I'll play the audio because I don't want to get yanked off of YouTube for this. You get up two and a half million dollars. Any asshole in the world knows what to do. You get a house with a 25 year roof, an indestructible Jap economy shitbox. You put the rest into the system of three to five percent to pay your taxes, and that's your base. Get me? That's your fortress of fucking solitude. That puts you for the rest of your life at a level of fuck you. Somebody wants you to do something? Fuck you. Boss pisses you off. Fuck you. <laughs> Own your house. Have a couple bucks in the bank. Don't drink. That's all I have to say to anybody at any social level. Did your grandfather take risks? Yes. I guarantee he did it from a position of fuck you. A wise man's life is based around fuck you. The United States of America is based on fuck you. You're a king. You have an army. Greatest navy in the history of the world. Fuck you. Blow me. We'll fuck it up ourselves. Which we have done. Beautiful fuck you position lost forever. So um, that basically encompasses everything that I thought regarding the Kanye interview. But again, it's a really enlightening one. I'll quickly read through some bits and pieces of here. Um, it says here, inside Kanye West's vision for the future. Um, first, he changed the sound of pop music. Then he revolutionized fashion and sneakers. Now Kanye West is redesigning the very building blocks of the family life, food, clothing and shelter. And he's claimed thousands of acres of Wyoming as a test site for his ideas. We followed West from Cody to Calabasas and from Cabo San Lucas to Paris to see it all firsthand and to talk to him about his next album, his altered ego and his renewed faith in God. So again, and I think you got a lot from this too because Will Welch, um, I'm assuming he's one of the um, editors-in-chief at GQ, is a good friend of Kanye's. He's known him since 2003. So there's a little bit more, um, it's less competitive this sort of interview there is a little bit more kinship there he does come at it from a friend point of view that also happens to be a journalist which always helps these kind of um, exposés with people that are a bit volatile um it tends to help when you have somebody that they actually respect or that they have a, a relationship with so that, i thought that was pretty cool and you have an awesome image of him in front of one of his um what you might call it um off-road vehicles they use at his ranch so some really cool pictures here but let me quickly get to the bits that i thought was cool uh <clears throat> 
or is it the, 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 the bits that are really cool are these little sections here just ahead of the interview so I think he interviews him in four different locations right interview one two and three and he kind of before each bit he kind of describes the setting or what happened prior what happened just before the interview took place and it gives you a real idea about you know number one how rich they are as a family and number two just how far um kind of sort of influence and reach in terms of you know creative endeavors in terms of stuff that he's doing for society in terms of his ideas how far they could actually go but there's some real cool bits that i liked here that i want to get into actually let me go on my profile because i've got some sections here that i highlighted for you guys to quickly check out where is it there we go so it's a tweet that i put out i put out some actual snippets that for of interest number one so the obviously the one thing that i think a lot of people are going to be interested in when it comes to talking about kanye is his trump endorsement i've not really that bothered about it um i'm over it have been over it for a while i think in the moment it was a little bit the reaction to it was a bit ott anyway i understand at the time that had represented a lot for americans especially people that are from marginalized groups blah de, blah de, blah but essentially he decided to kind of you know uh poke his head from underneath the parapet sort of stick his hand up and publicly state that he was a supporter of you know the now donald trump but i think for the most part if you are looking at the polling numbers you're looking at who he actually elected him where he was where he wants seats it you'd be you know it would be a fair guess to assume that there's quite a lot of people out there celebrities included who are also fans of trump but in terms of projecting their career in terms of making sure they don't lose their agents and they don't lose their bookers and don't lose their gigs they just keep it to themselves but of course kind of this is not going to do that but i like to kind of um explanation about it here in this little screenshot that i took so the question is here on here it says um, what is the responsibility of celebrities who are able to move culture there is this idea that you have no account you have to be accountable to people other than just yourself right so which is true because i think in one sense if you're kanye part of the reason why you affect part of the reason part of what gives you satisfaction is your ability to sell loads of sell your ideas right you can kind of package these weird shoes at the easy 350s right or the wave runners or the 700 sorry or the boots or the slides and you're able to present it to the general populace and then they're able to say yay or nay or you're able to present it to the populace they're able to say yay and then the other brands have to play catch up right so you're affecting culture in that way which is great right good for your bank balance good for your kids good for your ego or good for your legacy whatever it may be but then the other flip side too you have to also accept that if you are going against the grain which is the common you know maybe the the, the collective narrative of orange man bad you also have to you have to accept the kind of criticism that comes your way and i think that was what he kind of flopped at i think when he came out so strongly uh back in trump hugging him wearing a hat saying he was his dad and all that sort of shit he was coming at it from a combative point of view he was trying to fight fire with fire and i think what he should have done was just explain his point of view explain why he decided to kind of put his hand up and support him even if people didn't agree they would have they would have to respect his decision making but i think it was the fact that he didn't really come at it from any kind of point of there was no depth to his kind of thinking behind it there was no um it didn't seem like he knew anything about his policies it didn't seem like he'd actually worked through the idea of why he wanted to support him but just the fact that he you kind of got the feeling that he wanted to support him just because it wound people up which is you know which is fair enough if you want to be an antagonist it's cool but you know he's in his 40s isn't it to be a to be an antagonist when it comes to politics in your 40s it's a little bit cringe right it's, it's probably why people um kind of a cringe at the sight of morrissey saying edgy things and that you're an old man and like just relax no one cares anymore um i think it's cute and it's fun and it maybe can get it maybe can stir a reaction from when you're like 18 but once you have four kids and you live in a hill somewhere no one really thinks you're being counterculture by doing that but you know again he's his progress is to do that but anyway his answer what is responsibility to celebrities who are able to move culture there is this idea that you have to be accountable to people other than yourself and he says yeah usually you're accountable to people that are in control of your check and you're accountable for whatever they deem you to be the face of for the people that they are controlling through you so that's what celebrity in america truly means celebrities are scared celebrities don't have the real voice but i don't want to disorganize your celebrities i don't want to be sending shots at celebrities because i am one and i know a lot of them which is a really good point to make like 
part of the reason why you get these sanitized versions of celebs you get you know gal gadot doing imagine you get all these cringy unself-aware lacking in self-awareness um self-entitled self-centered just d- detached from reality celebrities is because for the most part they're, they're not they're not encouraged to engage with reality they're encouraged to kind of live in this sort of like alternate reality right this sort of parallel universe where everything kind of revolves around them right essentially each celebrity has like a team of what five people following them around right uh, maybe more the higher they go up in terms of uh popularity and then sometimes they have to purposely you know push people away if the, the higher they get up because they want to just remain normal but for the most part you know any adult that gets that kind of level of fame especially if you're a celebrity and you have an actual craft you're an actual you're an actor or you're a tv presenter or you're a comedian it's going to do something to your ego it's going to fuck you up a little bit right to be an adult where you're kind of being rewarded socially uh, monetarily uh, um, whatever it may be right through your talent it's going to affect you somewhere you're going to start feeling you're going to start feeling yourself you're going to start thinking your shit doesn't stink and then when it comes to finally trying to express yourself politically, right, because lives are at stake, because this actually affects real human beings, you're going to be encouraged not to say anything because all those nice trappings, all those nice holidays that you have, the fact that your mistress or whatever can live in this amazing apartment in the middle of Soho, the fact that you can gallivant around, you know, award shows is mostly tied to your ability to remain unproblematic, to not push and to not kind of ruffle feathers to not be annoying um to not get on people's nerves to not say the wrong thing you have to it's a really weird balance that where you're trying to you're, you're, you're trying to kind of pretend to be everything but yourself some people are willing to make that sacrifice some people are willing to say look give me that deal i'll trade my personality i'll trade who i am you know for i don't know how many hours in a day that is let's say it's like 18 hours in a day i'll pretend to be this other guy just so I can make sure that I have this house, I can go to these places, I have this car, I have this partner, I have this circle of friends, I can go to this place, I can go to this restaurant. People are willing to do that. But I think most sane people aren't, and which is why most sane people don't get into that kind of realm of celebrity or they kind of occupy a level of celebrity that allows you to still function as a normal human being. But I think once you reach that presenter that he has, you suddenly talk for everybody, right? I'm sure somebody like a Taylor Swift doesn't want to be political. I'm pretty sure she doesn't want to start, you know, voting and being a spokesperson for this or that. But it feels like she gets pushed into a corner to suddenly reveal who you're going to back. Are you a, Remember there was a big deal about Taylor Swift. Like, what is she? Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? And then she had to finally reveal, I'm a Democrat, guys. Don't worry. Chill out. I'm not one of the weird red people, right? And then you have to make sure you back the right person who's currently in the zeitgeist, who's currently at the flavor of the month. You have to say the right thing. You can't wear the wrong thing. You can't be speaking to the wrong person, quote unquote. It really is a golden handcuff, isn't it? That you're kind of bound to. And the, the, the average person isn't going to feel sorry for you. They're going to be like, oh, boohoo, you're complaining in your mansion. But I think the fact that he was able to say what he wanted to say about it, kind of go out there, put the hat on, wind everyone up, you know, um, generate loads of headlines, essentially, you know become the pariah of society shut him essentially isolate himself or uh what's that word called write himself off from the black society it was quite a brave move uh, regardless if you feel agree with how he did it or not i don't but i think that's what that's what he does in it that's what virgil does as well they sort of just learn in public they don't they don't do things privately they sort of put stuff out and just kind of iterate as it go along so I think what we saw first of all when he started speaking was his initial reaction, his initial impression, his initial kind of um, kickback and reaction to people getting at him. And now we're seeing somebody that's a little bit more clear minded. He sort of meditated on it a lot more. He's fought it through. He's spoken to a lot more people. He's got more insights on the issues that are going on. He's probably read a little bit more about it. And now we have just kind of clear minded, pretty grounded Kanye talking about everything. That was one quote. The next one here. Let's go on. Mm. here's another sh- int- quote that i thought was interesting he says um a lot of reaction to you wearing the hat was how cool could this guy um who gave the gift of george bush doesn't care about black people and now do this and he said black people are controlled by emotions through the media the media puts musicians artists celebrities and actors in a position to be the face of the race that they really don't have any power they really are just working for white people when it's said like that, it's kind of obvious, right? We emotionally connect to someone on your 
or someone of your colour on TV and feel that this person is speaking for us. So let me say this. I'm the founder of a $4 billion organisation, one of the most Google search brands on the planet, and I'll not be told who I'm going to vote on because of my colour. Now, if that speaks to you, cool, but I'm speaking for myself. And he can't really get more succinct than that, innit? Like, he finally addressed the TIs, the Joe Buddens, and all these people that were essentially calling out his blackness, which has always been a bit of a strange one. I think it's different, of course, in America, because I think they have, you know, however many years of slavery behind them. Um, Jim Crow, all these really, you know, disastrous things, you know, seeing somebody like a Martin Luther King again, you know, execute or getting assassinated, um, Malcolm X being assassinated like they've seen some really wild shit so I'm sure a lot of it is a lot of like P P S P T S D from these huge um, larger than life um, you know public figures within the black community you know being slain in front of their eyes right every time somebody within their culture gets a bit of success or tries to reach another level it seems like there's a little glass ceiling that they hit and they can't move make another move and stuff to do with police brutality so there's a lot of baggage that comes with it so i understand that the way people are black people are viewed in the states is different than they are here in europe but it was just it really was weird and i think it happens anyway in, in every in every in every um culture in every race there's always this weird um, rush to somehow attach or, you know, put celebrities next to these social causes or make them political or, you know, make them more than what they are, right? It, like, we're not satisfied with just having these people entertain us, right? Or provide us with tunes or provide us with clothing or provide us with funny moments or, you know, just to allow us to kind of be brain dead for half an hour watching Love Island. We we want more from these guys that, that quite clearly don't want to give us anymore, right? They they've been quite honest about what they want to do and how they want to do it, but somehow, some way, the public just keeps pushing for more and more and more. And at the moment they they kind of make a misstep, we then kind of chastise them. And it's probably worse within the black community, right? This is the idea that you have to kind of uh, follow this narrative that every black person is doing. And sometimes you might not agree, and, I've, and it's always been weird because I think I remember this TV series in America called um, was it Baldwin Hills or something Hills, where they essentially did a reality TV show that was set that was focused upon this um area in LA or California where it was a very affluent area that happened to be predominantly black or you know Hispanic, and it was kind of following these kids that lived in this 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 community where it was mostly private schools, mostly everyone around them was white and they happened to be black or Hispanic and the kind of difficulties about navigating um, that world, right, where you have wealth, you have um, status or whatever it may be, but you're still looked down upon because of the area that you, uh, the way place that you live in. And I thought that was a pretty good summation about what it means to be black and rich in America or, or, or be famous, you know, no matter where you are at, you are going to be looked down upon by others. So, the last thing you need is for your own community, it's for your own culture, it's for your own people to look at you uh, in another way because you decide to go, you decide to kind of veer off the collective narrative. And who wants a collective narrative? Who wants to? Who who doesn't? Who doesn't want to have an individual point of view? You come at, you come into life with an individual personality. You come into life forming your individual personality based on experiences that you go through. You we don't have collective experiences, right? That's probably why people are freaking out when Lil Wayne didn't want to didn't have anything bad to say about police officers or something right like as if like every black person has had a very um what's this thing called um contentious relationship with uh with law enforcement not everyone has had that it's like um it, you know it's like it reminds you it reminds you a little bit of like you know you hear people say it's a lot you can be you can you can have, you, you can be brought up in ends but it doesn't mean you're from ends right you can be from the hood but were you really putting in work not really right I, I grew up in a rough area i know people that went to prison i know people that have died through gun violence and knife violence and knife crime sorry whatever it may be but i wouldn't say i'm necessarily part of anything right i didn't stick anybody up right um i didn't jack anyone i just happened to live in an area so in that way sense in that with having that kind of way of thinking imagine our views on life would be completely different, wouldn't they? If you got that person out from school who stabbed somebody in the street and went to prison for 22 years, our way that we view the world is completely different, even though we lived next door to each other, our parents knew each other, with the sort of stuff, we broke bread, we played football. So, um, yeah, I'd never really got that, but hey, I'm, I'm glad he kind of put it succinctly and was able to kind of clarify his point there. And then I think the last one is this one. I'm going to quickly hear... 
is um, when we exit the office building, I stop in my tracks. I could swear that the Lamborghini was once again facing the opposite direction. Am I tripping? I say, or was the car facing the other direction? They were, they turned it around, Wes says. And I'm climbing the driver's seat. Only then I realize that we have not been alone since we landed at the airport five hours ago. Two additional Lamborghini Euroses are following us. They've painted matte black. So he has these, I'm assuming they're his special forces security team that follows him around. But that is the height of wealth in it. That's what you want. You want these two security officers in in nondescript cars that look exactly the same as you following you around and stuff. But yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, man. But definitely check it out. It's really inspiring and it'd be really cool. Um, some really cool insights about what he decides to do with his housing projects. Um, the, the Obviously, the photography is amazing because it all took place at his Wyoming ranch. Um, again, really well detailed. I like the fact that he styled himself with all his own clothes for the most part, stuff that you've seen him wear. Um, of course, the sheep that he's going to use for some of the cool everything he's doing. The fact that he uses his eight is about work, is about um, outfitting the work people who work in and around his, what you call it, compound, whatever it may be called, or service people in general. So I thought that was amazing. Definitely check it out. It's available now on GQ and loads of cool shots of him. And again, this is a pl one of the plans for. Um, what's this again? So one of the renderings by Claudio Silverstein and Kanye kind of West of a dome-shaped home that will eventually be built at Westlake Branch, Westlake Ranch, sorry, a systemic detailing proposed layout. So yeah, schematic, sorry, scheme systemic schematic layout. But yeah, definitely cool interview. I recommend you check it out. Super interesting.